So today we are going to talk about the principles of relevant Hong Kong law and the new company ordinance, NCO. So basically there are a couple of laws in Hong Kong. Okay, there's the common law, equity law, mercantile law, commercial law, ordinances, subsidiary legislation and customary law. We are going to talk about these today. So common law. What we need to know about common law with this exam. Common law is not created by stature or by the authority of the sovereign, but they were developed in the law courts. Common law is cemented by the doctrine of precedent, which means that they use previous case to make judgments and as reference to future interpretations. England is the origin of common law and the judges interpretation of common law and of statutes and legislation form case law. Okay, so that's what common law is. Law of equity. Common law remedies are available as of right, while remedies in equity are discretionary. Equity and common law can be used at the same time, but if there is a conflict between common law and equity, equity generally prevails, which means equity is more important than common law in general. So what is the application of law of equity in financial services industry? Okay, one of the very notable example would be injunction. An injunction is a court order prohibiting someone from doing something. So that if a court issues an order or issues an injunction for you to stop doing something, you better stop it. Okay, and then the second thing is a specific performance. That is a court order that a person must carry out his part of the contract. Specific performance is uh, a, an order that is related to a contract. If a party of a contract fails to perform, a specific performance order basically requires that uh, party uh, from uh, carrying out his uh, part of the contract, requires him to carry out his part of the contract. Recession. Rescission is a remedy provided by the court which aims to restore the parties to their original position as if the contract was void, which means that to return to the state before the contract. This once again has something to do with a contract. With rescission as a court order, basically both parties agreed or have to agree to return to the stage, to the status before they sign the contract. Or before the contract was enacted okay and rectification rectification is a court order taken by the court to clarify the contract when it does not properly record the intentions of the parties to it basically to clarify and rectify to make sure both parties have a mutual agreement and have a mutual understanding of what the contract actually means that's rectification Okay, mercantile law and commercial law, all you need to know with regards to this exam is that it exists. Okay, a good example would be sale of good ordinance and bills of exchange ordinance. All you need to know are the names. Primary legislations. Primary legislations are called ordinances. Ordinances are basically law. If you violate the ordinance or provision of an ordinance, there's a possibility it's not a must but there's a possibility you go to jail okay primary legislations are called ordinances they are passed by legislative council which is the uh, lawmaking body of hong kong um, basically every law proposed by uh, the executive council or proposed or being proposed should be passed by the legislative council the legislative council have the right to ban any laws from forming. So basically that's the lawmaking body. And uh, once they are passed by the legal, primary legislation will be enacted by the chief executive of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region with the advice of the legal. Basically uh, it will become effective once it's passed by the legal and enacted by the chief executive of Hong Kong. Okay. Okay, then we are going to talk about subsidiary legislations. Subsidiary legislations may sound unimportant, but in fact, they are also laws. Subsidiary legislations are basically part of 
primary legislations. Subsidiary legislations are made by a process of delegations from LegCo to other administrative bodies. Such delegations usually are done under an ordinance. For example, um, the Securities and Futures Ordinance is a primary legislation and under the Securities and Futures Ordinance, there are a lot of subsidiary legislations like client money rules, client securities rules. These are also laws, but they are subsidiary legislations that are enacted because of the primary legislation, the Securities and Futures Ordinance, and these laws are proposed by the SFC, which has its powers delegated by the Legislative Council. Okay. And once the SFC comes uh, with a proposal to the LegCo, the LegCo has an opportunity to review the subsidiary legislation before it becomes law. If LegCo believes that the proposal is not right or unjust or unfair or inefficient or in whatever manner not very suitable, then it has the right to ban and reject the law from being effective. The Securities uh, and Futures Commission has extensive power to make rules under the Securities and Futures Ordinance. These rules are the subsidiary legislations I just talked about. Okay. Independence of the judiciary. Okay. The judiciary of Hong Kong is completely independent of the government and other parts of um, the governmental body. Okay, judges are not politically appointed and make the decision on the basis of their interpretation of the law. Judges are not subjected to pressure from the government, from the legislative council, that is the lawmaking body, the public, the media or any pressure. Supposedly they are completely independent, but uh, well, let's not go into that. Criminal law. Criminal law are basically offenses against the community. Only the court system can handle cases regarding criminal law. Okay, the case is brought by the Department of Justice, which is an administrative body of the government. It represents the government and the public to sue somebody else against the wrongdoer. Basically, uh, when it's a criminal case, basically it is uh, brought by the Department of Justice and sue the wrongdoer. Punishment is usually involved in a criminal case, and since it's criminal, it's very, very serious, strong evidence is needed before a person is found guilty of a criminal offense. The case has to be proved beyond reasonable doubt. The key word is respond be, uh, reasonable doubt, like in any court movie or TV drama series, beyond reasonable doubt is the uh, burden of proof. And the burden of proof is usually on the prosecutor, that is, the prosecutor has to prove that uh, the defendant is guilty, okay? And offenders have the risk of if imprisonment if there is a criminal case, and only the government, that is the Department of Justice, have the privilege to uh, conduct litigation, okay? Civil law. Civil law are basically laws regarding rights and damages. That means money, well, basically money. Well, the intention of civil law is to provide remedy, that is, to recover the losses or to compensate for the losses of the rights being infringed. Okay? The court order of a, or award is made if the plaintiff, plaintiff that means that um, the person applying for compensation or recovery, if the plaintiff can prove his claim on balance of probabilities. That means that if he can prove that his losses is very probable, it's very likely, then his claim is definitely legitimate. This standard of proof or burden of proof is much less stringent than the level of uh, beyond reasonable doubt required in criminal case. That means it is easier to prove someone responsible than in the criminal case. Civil law can be uh, interpreted in multiple ways and the case can be brought in a civil court in the name of the plaintiff against the defendant. That means the person who is claiming and trying to apply for damage against the defendant can do so in court. Breach of the civil law will not impose any prison sentence because it is not a crime against the public. It is merely damages and recovery of damages that they are arguing about. 
or infringement of rights in general, basically fighting for money. So what are the differences between criminal law and civil law? Let us summarize in this table. In criminal law, the objective is to punish the wrongdoer. And for civil law, it is to provide remedies and recovery for the injured or uh, party suffering damages or infringements. Okay, um, the person or the system that is responsible for judiciary for criminal law must be law courts, whereas for civil law, administrative tribunals can also hear cases with regards to civil law. And the plaintiff of um, criminal law is definitely the Department of Justice, whereas for civil law, it can be the Department of Justice, the party suffering damages and infringements, or other state appointed authorities. Okay. Uh, for a standard of proof, it is much more serious in criminal law and the standard of proof is much higher. That is beyond reasonable doubt for criminal law. And for civil law, it's less stringent. So it will be the balance of probabilities, okay? And consequences for violating criminal law, you may face risk of imprisonment. Whereas for civil law, since it is not for punishment, there will not be any possibility for prison sentence or prison time, okay? Remember, application of criminal law and civil law can happen simultaneously, okay? For example, a traffic accident may involve the crime of grievous hurt and cause serious injury, leading to civil claims for damages, okay? So in a car crash, there can be civil cases and criminal cases at the same time. Contract law. Well, basically we have to define what a contract is. A contract is an agreement created by two or more people or parties that is recognizable under law. It is enforceable by law, can be made orally or in writing. And both parties need to come up with a cost, come up with a consideration. A good example may be the purchase or sale of a security or futures contract the acceptance by an investor of an initial public offering, an undertaking to manage a mutual fund, and the purchase of a leveraged foreign exchange contract. These are all good examples of contracts, okay? A fiduciary relationship. Fiduciary has a duty to act for the benefit of the other. A fiduciary is a person who owes another person duties of good faith, trust, confidence, honesty, and care. A good example may be parent and child. A parent is a fiduciary to his child, okay? Agency is a kind of fiduciary relationship. It is very special. It involves beneficial relationship or commercial elements. That is, the agent as a fiduciary acts on behalf of the principal and bind the principal by those of his words or actions that are within the scope of his agency, okay? The agent is doing so because there are commercial elements or benefits involved. That basically means agency is a form of fiduciary relationship with commercial benefits or commercial elements. An agent is a fiduciary who represents his principal for monetary benefits, okay? The application of agency law. Basically, stockbrokers and clients are agency relationship. A stockbroker can be an agent for his client. The pecuniary interest is the commission. The stockbroker himself or herself and the company he works for or she works for uh, may be considered as an agency relationship as well. The account executive, that is the salesperson, may be considered as the agent of the stockbroking company. The pecuniary interests are salary or commission, okay? Both of them are examples of agency. Responsibility of the principal, that is the boss of the agency relationship. 
A principal or the boss is liable for the acts of his agent, his employee. For example, a firm is liable if an ex account executive it employs and has held out to be acting for the firm cheats a client. Then the company is responsible for the client's damage in this case because the account executive is acting on behalf of the firm. So next in line, we are going to talk about law of tort. When parties have no contractual relationship, are in a situation where one party, that is one guy or one company, suffers loss or damage as a result of the act of the other, a wrong or tort may have occurred. That means an in, uh, infringement of uh, rights or damages in general. And under civil law, a liability may have arisen. Okay, so there are various breaches of the law of tort, of which the tort of negligence has the most direct application in securities and futures uh, businesses and industries. The tort of negligence is one of the committed as a result of a failure to observe the standard of care expected under law in a particular case. Um, in general, if financial advisor are negligent in giving advice and other people suffer losses, due to the reliance on his or her advice, the financial advisor may be exposed to actions of thought if there are no relationship between the financial advisor and the sufferer in general. Okay. So next we are going to talk about employment law. Under employment law, an employer must provide his employee with remuneration, that is salary, indemnity for expenses that is uh, to claim for expenses the claim for expenses uh, losses and liabilities incurred while the employee is performing his or her duties the employer is also responsible for providing a safe working environment for the employee okay um, an employee in return should demonstrate skills and competence and give faithful and loyal service to his employer. Also, the employee should be obedient and confident in providing his service and also maintain a high degree of confidentiality to protect the interests of his or her employer. Okay. If either one of uh, employer or employee fail to uh, honor these uh, responsibility or duties in their relationship, there can be a breach in the employment contract and might result in uh, other civil consequences in general. So next we are going to talk about the Hong Kong Special Administrative Regions Court and Tribunal System. Okay, before we start, we have to know that the Court of Appeal, the Court of Final Appeal, is the highest court in Hong Kong. It is headed by the Chief Justice Okay, this is basically where they made the final decision on any legal dispute or legal proceedings in Hong Kong. This is the highest court in general. Okay, as you can see here. High court, high court is a level lower than the court of final appeal. Okay, it hears appeal from other courts and um, basically, they carry out initial, um, we call them first instance, court of first instance uh, for more serious cases such as murder or a very high level civil dispute. It is carried out in the court of first instance. And the court of appeal of the higher courts uh, listens to appeal from uh, decisions and judgments made by the district court and the district court. So if you have a case that was ruled by the district court and you're not happy with it, you go to the court of appeal of the high court. Okay. And still, if you are not satisfied, you go to the court of final appeal. You go upwards in the chart on the right hand side. Okay. And if you have a very serious case, for example, murder or a very serious case of drugs, then you would go to court of first instance without going through the district court and the district court um, below. Okay, so that's the high court. Then next in line, we are going to talk about district court. District court hears a, a um, serious case, but not as serious as the high court. 
okay for example um, it might handle civil cases no more than uh, 1 million Hong Kong dollars so if it is less than 1 million Hong Kong dollars it can go to through the district court system if it is more than a million it will go to the uh, high court um, the court of first instance of the high court okay and it might include uh, crimes such as uh, I don't know sex related crimes and all that I mean this is where the district court handle these stuff or theft or burglary that kind of stuff if it is a very serious case of drugs it will go to the high court instead okay um, the district court hears less serious criminal offenses and impose smaller sentence than the district court basically a very um, um, minor uh, for very minor crimes we will go to the district court for example um, the, the magistrate court for example minor traffic offenses um, hawking um, that kind of stuff administrative tribunal this is very very important when you see the word tribunal you know that it handles civil cases only okay tribunal just in general do not belong to the court system and therefore is not on the chart on the right hand side okay for example market misconduct tribunal mmt is a tribunal that handle cases with regards to market misconduct we will talk about market misconduct later on but all you have to know is that tribunals are basically um, governmental bodies that make judgments on civil cases okay they do not handle criminal cases in general okay that's all you need to know about tribunals okay so this is a summary of tribunals and courts okay in the court system the legal process is more lengthy and cumbersome whereas in administrative tribunal it's simpler much easier okay the burden of proof is much straighter in law courts and less straight in administrative tribunals time required is longer for law courts and shorter for administrative tribunals the law courts can handle both civil cases and criminal cases and the tribunals can only handle civil cases okay examples of the law court system can be the court of final appeal high court district court and magistrate court okay and for administrative uh, tribunal in the um, in the context of this exam you would see uh, you will see market misconduct tribunal the securities and futures appeals tribunal lands tribunal and labor tribunals these tribunals handle civil cases which basically means fighting over money okay they handle damages and money related cases that's civil cases okay so next in line we are going to talk about arbitration arbitration is a process of resolving business dispute basically once again fighting over money okay it involves one or more impartial third party whose decision is accepted so basically uh, parties in dispute will find a middleman will find an impartial third party a middleman or a company to resolve their dispute and this decision of this impartial third party this middleman will be final the parties involved in the dispute must accept that the decision is binding okay since it is not a legal process in a traditional sense the arbitration process and decision is not appealable you cannot appeal the arbitration results okay arbitration is fast cheap informal and private okay and in hong kong the hong kong international arbitration center was set up to provide domestic and international arbitration okay under the securities and futures ordinance some um, regulated activity can be handled by arbitration for example the leverage foreign exchange trading disputes can be submitted to arbitration okay confidentiality is a key advantage of arbitration because because it's informal and private however it is not good for people unfamiliar with the law let me tell you why okay in a traditional um, court system or tribunal settings okay even if you don't win 
even if you don't win. Future cases can take your case as precedence. Okay, if you win, your victory will be the precedence of future cases, which leads to um, the uh, party you have dispute with at a disadvantage. At a disadvantage. Okay, suppose you have a big case dispute with the HSBC, which involves a sum, paltry sum of like a hundred k. Okay. If you carry this dispute in a traditional court, you might win or you may lose. If you win, future disputes similar to yours might be used against HSBC. Whereas in an arbitration sense, even if a process, even if you win, your results won't be precedent in future cases. So big companies want you to use arbitration to their advantage. So please don't use it. It's it's, it's, it's a trickery, mockery uh, to take advantage of small retail investor in general. But that, please do not um, answer the question like that in the exam. I'm just telling you that that's the reality, okay? Okay, new companies ordinance, okay? Uh, the new company ordinance in Hong Kong was introduced in 2014 to replace uh, the existing company's ordinance, okay, the old company's ordinance for say. The new company ordinance, the NCO, permits the formation of a company by one or more person, okay. One member constitutes a quorum for a meeting of a company having only one member. So basically in Hong Kong, under the new company's ordinance, you can set up a company with only one natural person, okay. A company is a separate legal entity, basically a legal person, distinct from its members. Members in here means shareholders. So basically, if you basically set up a business with your friend, you both chip in like $20,000, then you can form a company. And that company is distinct from you and your friend, who are the members and shareholders of the company. Basically, the law treat the company you formed, your friend and you as three different entities, three different persons. Okay, a company basically can do a lot of things. They can make contracts, take legal actions, sue people, be sued, own property, commit crimes and torts. Okay, um, company basically lasts forever and will only cease to exist if it is dissolved or wind up. Okay. It has perpetual succession in a sense. Limited company is the most common type of company where the liability of its member is limited because the company is distinct from you and other members or shareholders. The shareholders or members won't be liable for what the company is liable for. It is limited liability that means liability incurred by the company will not be passed on to its members and shareholders if a company uh, is owing someone else's money or incur some kind of indemnity or damage the members won't be liable because it is a limited liability company okay that's why it's called a limited company Okay, types of Hong Kong company. In Hong Kong, we have three types of company. One of them is called a private company. Second type is called a public company. And the third type is called a guaranteed company. Okay. So what is a private company? A private company is a small company, basically. It cannot have more than 50 members, that is 50 shareholders. Basically, there are a lot of restrictions on how its shares can be transferred, bought and sold, and a private company cannot and may not offer shares or debentures, basically bonds, to the public. And as a private company, it cannot belong to a guarantee company in general. Okay, So that is what a private company is. A, a good example may be a stationery shop, a restaurant, usually they are formed as a private company okay how about a public company a public company is basically something that is not a private company and not a guarantee company we'll go into guarantee company uh, later on okay a public company is not a private company and not a guarantee company 
okay it is basically owned by a lot of shareholders with little rights to restrict the transfer of its shares as opposed to private companies okay uh, a listed company in Hong Kong must be a public company but you should bear in mind not all public companies are listed public companies are usually listed but not necessarily listed that's something you should bear in mind a good example may be Cafe de Coral um, a fast food restaurant chain in Hong Kong that is a form of a public company okay how about guarantee company guarantee company is something that is not a private company and not a public company and the most distinctive feature is that it does not have a share capital guarantee company do not or guarantee companies do not have a share capital usually the liability of its member that is the shareholder or member of the guarantee company is limited by the company's articles to a specific amount so basically the member are only liable to a certain amount okay if the company is wind up or have some liability uh, they are, they like it, the company should um, bear it uh, the members of the company can only bear a limit a certain limit when the company is bankrupt or facing winding up order or incur some damages or liability up to a point okay generally guarantee company are, are professional bodies or non-profit organization a good example of a guarantee company is the hong kong securities and investment institute that is where you take the hksi exam that is a guarantee company articles of association when someone forms a company basically they have to set up the basic rules and regulations of that particular company okay the articles of association is like the constitution of the company it is an essential document to establish a company and it basically forms the agreement between the company and its member the member and the company agrees to act according to the articles of association that is the constitution of the company you can treat it as such okay um, basically the articles of association prescribes regulations for the internal management and operations of the company it will detail for example how to become an officer what are the powers of the officers directors company secretaries how do you help meetings who are the members and what are the voting procedures uh, how do you restrict capital how do you transfer shares issue dividends declare dividends that kind of stuff and some miscellaneous provision basically you can treat articles of association as a contract between the members of the company and the company and this is also the constitution of the company that is basically what articles of association is okay share capital okay under the NCO new companies ordinance shares in a company have no par value okay you do not need to know what par value is only remember the phrase there's no par value okay that is good enough for the exam company share capital may include three different types for example ordinary shares preference shares and redeemable shares okay that's all you need to know just the names okay then we are going to talk about ordinary shares okay ordinary shares is the basic unit of ownership in a company okay holder of ordinary shares are entitled to share in distribution of past and current profits but may only do so after preference shareholders okay so basically they can share the profit of the company if the directors of the company decided it is suitable to do so okay the distribution of past and current profits are not fixed okay uh, basically they might receive some profit and they might not okay and in the case of a company winding up the holders of ordinary shares are entitled to the balance of the realized net assets after employees creditors preference shareholders and dependent shareholders they have to deduct uh, the amount for all these people 
before common stock or ordinary shareholder receives some residual out of the net assets. So usually they get nothing when the company wind up. Okay. The holders of ordinary shares carry the maximum risk in bad times and have the opportunity to ex experience and obtain maximum returns when the company is doing well. Okay. There's also a very, very important feature of ordinary shares. That is, they can vote in members meeting or shareholders meeting. Okay, that is very important. Whereas preference shares holders do not. That's one of the features you should know. Okay. Preference shares. The issue of preference shares must be authorized by the company's articles of association. Okay. A preference share have a fixed return. That is the holders of preference shares can receive a fixed dividend according uh, to uh, what's listed in the stock. Okay. In the case of a company winding up, the holder of preference shares are entitled to the balance of realized net assets after employees and creditors. That is if the company is winding up, uh, the company should pay to the employee and then to creditors. And then if there's any residual net assets, it will be distributed to preference shareholders. And after preference shareholders are paid, the residual will go to um, um, ordinary shares. Okay. The holders of uh, participating preference shares have the right not only to a fixed dividend, but also to share in some part of the remaining distributable profits. Um, participating preference share is basically a hybrid between ordinary shares and preference shares. That's all you need to know with regards to the exam. Okay. Redeemable shares. Okay. Redeemable shares is not a type of shares, but actually a feature of ordinary shares and preference shares okay redeemable shares are shares that can be redeemed and cancelled after the issuance of shares normally shares that are issued like preference shares and ordinary shares cannot be cancelled but redeemable shares can be redeemed and thus cancelled after the shares has been issued after a period of time the company can redeem these shares that's why they are called redeemable okay Redemption of redeemable shares can be financed out of distributable profits that are profits of the company, the proceed of a new share issue made for the purpose of redemption and existing share capital. Okay, so basically the company can use its own money to redeem uh, shares that are redeemable in general. So when a redeemable shares are redeemed, they are treated as cancelled and there will be a reduction in the amount of its share capital because there are less shares outstanding. Okay. And a reduction in its distributable profit if the shares were redeemed out of the company's profit and a reduction in both its share capital and profit if it is redeemed out of capital and profit uh, uh, simultaneously. Okay. Debentures, bonds, basically. A debenture is basically an IOU. It's basically a slip of paper saying that the company owes a certain individual or company um, a certain amount of money. Okay. A debenture is a document issued by the company as evidence of a loan and is generally transferable. The holder of the debenture or bond is a creditor of that company and receives interest at a fixed rate. Okay. So basically, a slip of paper with interest. Bonds are not equity, so bondholders are not shareholders or bosses, but creditors of the company. The debenture or bondholders will rank before shareholders for payment of interest prior to the distribution of dividends. That is, a company has to pay bondholders before they can issue dividends. Uh, okay. In the case of a company winding up, the holders of debentures are given priority to the distribution of the balance of net realizable assets. So basically when a company wind up, the company has to pay its employee then to um, these uh, creditors, bondholders, 
and then to preference shareholders and then to ordinary shareholders okay debentures can be for a fixed term and can be redeemable the bond can be secured or unsecured by secured it means it is secured by a piece of collateral okay a secured holder has prior rights to the security over unsecured creditors okay that is the uh, ranking order in terms of the venture holders okay meetings and procedures okay in general shareholders or members of a company do not affect and affect company decisions they do not make decisions for the company in general okay company meetings uh, of shareholders are very important because in general they are the only avenue or opportunity for shareholders to exercise any control if any in the company or take part in its operations because normally uh, cigar smoking big swinging bosses of the company will be the man in charge not your you small pitiful uh, elderly orphans or widows and sons okay you guys are not important you are shareholders but you are not a big swinging boss okay so in addition to annual general meetings other general meetings may be requested at times by the directors by shareholders or by court but these are very uncommon okay this is very uncommon uh, usually bosses and directors decide everything and once a year there will be an annual general meeting for widows and sons and that kind of small pitiful uh, shareholders to uh, participate in a general meeting to uh, take part in the decision making process of the company okay so what should be the frequency of annual general meeting a company is required to hold a general meeting uh, of shareholders or members within 18 months of incorporation okay and every annual general meeting since then should last no longer than 15 months that is no longer than 15 months apart for each annual general meeting okay the business of an annual general meeting include the consideration of the annual accounts that is to verify and to decide whether the annual accounts are truthful and appropriate and the declaration of dividends basically to issue dividends if there are any the election of directors to replace retiring ones and the appointments of auditors basically in a general meeting these uh, things will be discussed and decided okay the members can take part in questioning the directors for example questioning how they are doing their job whether they are doing it properly and provide suggestions and recommendations the members also known as shareholders can also question the auditors in the process of a general meeting during a general meeting that is so what kinds of powers can be exercisable by members in a general meeting these include the changes of articles of association and company name matters relating to buybacks issuance of shares at a discount alteration of capital including reductions variation of class rights corporate arrangements and reconstructions appointment and removal of auditors removal of directors disposal of company assets approval of payment for few, for loss of office winding up petition under court order and voluntary winding up these are all powers exercisable by members in a general meeting okay they can propose so basically we are going to talk about resolutions resolutions are basically agreements made by members of a company okay and the company should act according to resolutions made okay there are a couple ways to pass a resolution one of the ways to pass a resolution is to be passed by circulation and signature by all members voting on resolutions by a show of hands in general meeting are also one of the ways to uh, pass a resolution okay the NCO the new company's ordinance set out procedures for proposing and circulating written resolutions 
and resolutions can used uh, can be used to determine the company's uh, operational guidelines. Okay. Special resolution, as the name suggests, special resolution is a very very special resolution made by the members. A special resolution is one passed by at least 75% of members at a general meeting. That means voting in person by a show of hands. Okay, proxies or um, agents are allowed. It should be noted that no less than 21 days of notice should be given if a special resolution is to be passed in a general meeting. It should also specify the intention to pass the resolution has been given to shareholders with no less than 21 days notice. Okay. Um, matters that requires a special resolution may be uh, the reduction of share capital, winding up of the company voluntarily or by court, alteration of objects, alteration of articles of associations, these are all matters that should be passed by a special resolution. And once a special resolution has been passed or made, a copy of the special resolution must be lodged with the registrar of companies within 15 days of it being passed. That's special resolution. Okay. Ordinary resolution. An ordinary resolution is a resolution which may be passed by 50% of members present at voting by voting at a um, general meeting. That is a show of hands at a general meeting. More than 50% of members. Okay. Notices must be given to uh, members or shareholders if an ordinary resolution is to be passed. Uh, some of the things that might require an ordinary resolution may, meet, may include the removal of auditors before the expiration of their terms of office and the removal of a director before his or her term expires. Basically, to fire the auditors and directors of a companies, these firing might require an ordinary resolution to be passed. Okay, this is ordinary resolution. In Hong Kong, in general, we try to provide a fair, orderly and transparent market uh, for private companies and public companies alike. That's why we offer a lot of protection to members and minority shareholders of a company. Okay. So some of the uh, protective measures include members that are shareholders with 5% or more of the paid up capital of a company which carries voting right may request the directors of a company to call for a meeting. Once they are meeting, they can propose resolution and all that to change uh, a company. Okay. If the companies or directors do not listen to this request and do not adhere to this request, the members may do so by themselves. Okay. The NCO also enables a company to vary the rights of the holders of a class of shares. Okay. However, if the shareholders of at least 10% of the total voting rights in that class may petition the court to have the variation cancelled if it is against their interest, the decision of the court is final so that the, the court can overrule over what is decided by the directors or annual general meeting. Okay. 100 members or 10% of the holders of the company of the issued shares may ask the financial secretary to appoint an investigator into the company's affairs. So basically 10% or 100 members of a company can request the financial secretary to investigate into the company affairs if they believe they have been treated uh, mis uh, unfairly basically. An individual member, basically one member, can petition the court if the affairs of the company are being conducted in a manner prejudicial to the interest of the holder himself. Okay. A member may also apply to the court for an order if he con or she considers that the affairs of a company are being conducted in a manner uh, that are basically prejudicial to the interest of the member's general or some part of the members. Okay. Um, 
Basically, any member can petition for a winding up, but whether the petition will be effective, that's another matter, okay? Duties of a director. So basically, a director of a company is basically the head of the company. A director must exercise reasonable care, skills and diligence in achieving his duties. A director should also meet the objective test and subjective test. An objective test is a test that tests the general knowledge, skill and experience that may reasonably be expected of a person carrying out the functions carried out by the directors in relations to the company. Okay? And a subjective test is the general knowledge, skill and experience that the director has by himself. Okay? That means uh, not comparing with others. Okay? So basically the court may intervene if some members request the court to intervene okay what kind of cases can a court intervene okay a court can intervene if some members wants to enforce some personal rights with regards to a company a court can also intervene if some of the rights of the members has been infringed which affects all or a number of members in a similar fashion the court can also intervene uh, to allow um, the small uh, shareholders or members of a company to act on behalf of the company to sue the management of the company or a third party that is causing harm or damages. That are actions that a court can do upon the request of small individual shareholders or members. Okay. Officers of a company may include directors, managers, and company secretaries, okay? Every company, according to the new company's ordinance, should have at least one person, one natural person as a director, okay? And every private company uh, should have its director appointed by the members acting in the general meeting, okay? The general powers to manage the business of a company are vested in the directors. Okay. Shadow directors. So what exactly are shadow directors? Shadow directors are people, are persons who are not directors of a company, but act like one. And people inside the company will treat this person as if he or she is the director of the company. So by law and on paper, this shadow director is not a director, but people inside that company treated him or her as if he or she is the director. Or for example, a founder might have stepped down from his director role in a company, but people inside the company still treat him or her as a director even if he or she is not a director on paper. So what are the qualifications of directors? Directors in a Hong Kong company must be aged 18 or above. They must not be undischarged bankrupts. They must not be disqualified by court order. And there are four principal grounds for such an order being made. For example, a conviction of an indictable offence from fraud or dishonesty, a persistent default in relations to the NCO, a fraud in relations to company matters or fraudulent trading, and a finding of being unfit uh, for, dicta uh, for directorship for an insolvent company. Okay, so basically, you can be a director if you are an uh, aged 18 or above, uh, is not an undischarged bankrupt and is not disqualified by court order. Okay, so no fraud and no other dishonest behavior. If you have these fraud or dishonest behaviors, it is very unlikely that you will be qualified as a director of a company. Power of directors. Remember, directors are not bound by resolution passed by members in a general meeting. Although a director should generally act according to the resolutions made, um, directors have some kind of discretionary power um, in general. Okay? 
members in general should not override future management actions of the directors once a director has been selected. Okay. However, if members are really dissatisfied, they can, in a general meeting, uh, on, and only in a general meeting, interfere with the management if the directors are unwilling to act or seeking approval to act beyond uh, their powers or acting in breach of their fiduciary duties. Okay, so basically members can only intervene in a general meeting and outside of the general meeting, the director has his or her power according to the resolutions and other uh, kind of power delegation delegated by the members in general. Okay. Board meetings. The board here means board of directors. Under common law, directors should exercise their power as a group by having board meetings. Okay. And in the board meetings, they made a lot of decisions together. Directors. There are multiple directors in a company, so they uh, make a decision as a group effort. And they also pass resolutions that are uh, then passed on to other functional departments of the company. Okay. And these resolutions passed by the board of directors should be minuted. That means recorded. Written records of these decisions uh, should be well kept and maintained. And under the NCO, some companies may only have one director. And if that's the case, a, uh, any written records of a decision made by the sole director of a private company shall be sufficient evidence of that decision. That is, the decision is made if a written record or any kind of written instructions from the sole director is provided. Okay, His signature is his bond and he is the representation of the company, the representative of the company. Okay. Directors fiduciary duty. The directors are basically agents of the company and therefore they have a fiduciary relationship with the company. They must act with the utmost good faith towards the principal, that is the company. For example, they should act in good faith for the benefit of the company, exercise their power for the proper purpose and ensure that there's no conflict of interest between their directed duties and their personal interest in general, okay? Just like other agents who work for the company. Liabilities of directors. Directors of a company may subject to criminal liability, which includes fines and imprisonment for untruthful statements made in the prospectus, okay? And a director, when he or she violates the NCO, such as failing to prepare financial statements when required to do so, may also have some kind of criminal or civil liability. So all you need to know is that um, directors, while being accountable and responsible for the company actions, may incur some personal uh, civil or criminal liability for not doing his job uh, according to the law uh, while he was representing the company. Okay. Remedies for breach of duties of directors. Okay, if a director breaches its duties, what are the remedies? What can be done? Okay, an injunction may be obtained to stop the director from having a breach, from conducting the breach. And if the directors have not disclosed a personal interest in a contract they have made on behalf of the company, basically trying to profit off the company, the contract he or she made may be cancelled at the option of the company, for example, to carry out a rescission, okay, to restore um, the status back to um, the, uh, the stage before the contract was made, okay. All directors who have acted in the breach of their duties will be jointly and severely liable to the company for damages if that's the case. If the directors have wrongly profited by dealing with the company's property, and all that, the directors must be accountable to the company for such profits. That is, they have to pay back, in addition to potential criminal consequences. Okay. So how to relieve for directors? Let's suppose some breaches carried out by directors may be of good faith. For example, um, directors may act beyond 
his or her powers delegated by the members for the sake of the company, for good causes. In this case, um, members of a company can provide relief. For example, to provide ratification, ratification um, to clarify and uh, to give relief to the director. Okay. If the members of a company decide to provide a relief, um, he or she, the members in general, can do so by passing a resolution. And in addition to that, the court may also give relief to directors if the directors have shown to have acted honestly and reasonably in respect of his or her breach of duties. Okay, so basically, even if the directors have a breach of his, his or her duties, um, if it is out of good faith, honesty and of good causes, um, he or she might be relieved. Conflict of interest between directors and the companies. If a director or his or her connected entity is directly or indirectly interested, that is significant in relations to the company's business, he or she must, as soon as reasonably practicable for a transaction for arrangement that has been entered into, and before the company enters into the transactions or arrangement for a proposed transaction or arrangement, declare to other directors that he has some kind of conflict of interest and the nature and extent of that conflict of interest to the board. Okay, so basically, if a director has some conflict of interest that is uh, potential and uh, uh, or material, he or she may be as soon as reasonably practicable disclose this conflict of interest to the board of directors so that other directors can make the decision whether it's fair or not for him or her. Okay. Directors remunerations. Authority of payment is provided in the company articles. The remuneration of directors is determined by the company in general meeting. And in a general meeting, the members of the company, that is the shareholders, the, the shareholders in general, uh, decide how much is being paid uh, to the directors. This usually covers directors' fees and other bonuses or other service contracts in general. If a director holds some other positions, such as managing director or executive director, he or she can have an additional uh, service contract is needed. Okay, so basically a director's job is a director's job. He or she might have other roles to play in the company. It's possible. Loans to directors. Without the approval of the company's members, the company cannot directly or indirectly make a loan to the company's director. Enter into a guarantee for such a loan. That means guaranteeing um, the company's director to apply for a personal loan from a bank or from other institutions. Okay. Uh, basically, the company cannot make a loan or guarantee to a director of its holding company or individuals connected with a director as well such as the director's adult child, parent, or a cohabitant, okay? But there are exceptions. If a company is making a loan to a director of value or a loan of value not exceeding 5% of the company's net assets, it's okay. And if a loan is made to repay the director's um, damage or um, existing loan to the company, then this loan can be maintained. OK, and another exception is that if the members of the company agrees to this loan, the company can, in fact, lend to the directors of the company under the approval of its members. OK. Companies audit and investigations. Investigations on a company may be ordered by the financial secretary and the company itself. OK. Um, an internal investigation may be conducted. The financial secretary may also appoint inspectors in the following circumstances. Okay, an application can be made 
by the specific number of members, as we talked about earlier, that that is 10% of the overall share capital or voting rights, or a hundred members. Okay, an internal investigation carried out can also be passed by a special resolution requesting the appointment of an inspector. If the financial secretary suspects fraud in the business or formation of the company, or if there are any oppressive conduct being present, or an intent to defraud creditors, the financial secretary may also appoint inspector to inspect the company. Okay. The duty to assist inspector. Basically, um, all present and past officer and agents of the company including bankers, solicitors, and auditors are required to assist. The exceptions are solicitors who cannot be forced to provide privileged uh, communications. Okay, The inspector can also um, not force the bank to provide information unrelated to the company being inspected. Okay, We are going to talk about liquidation and winding up now. A company lasts forever unless it is liquidated or wind up okay liquidation is a the worst part of a company okay if a company faces liquidation they are in big trouble so why how how can it happen i mean how can liquidation happen for a company basically a liquidation is ordered by the court and the liquidator who liquidate the company which uh, uh um, basically carry out the liquidation process as appointed by the court. We call him or her the official receiver. So who can petition for a liquidation by court? The company itself, a creditor, a contributory, the financial secretary, the registrar of companies, the official receiver, and the SFC can order the court to liquidate the company. Since it is a legal process, it is more complex. Okay. Some of the reasons for having a compulsory liquidation might be the company has by a special resolution resolved that the company should be wind up by court and the company does not commence its business within one year from its incorporation or suspend, suspends its business for a whole year or the company has no members remaining uh, or the company is unable to pay its debt or in the event if any occurrence of which the articles provided the, the, the companies to be dissolved. The uh, court is of opinion that it is just and equitable that the company should be wound up. Examples are if the main object of the company has failed, the company was formed for a fraudulent purposes and the basis of mutual trust, understanding and confidence on which the company was formed no longer exist. If these causes were present or are present, then um, a compulsory liquidation may occur. Okay, so how about voluntary winding up? How is it different from um, liquidation? Well, a winding up is a voluntary action. It can be uh, carried out if the reason sufficed. For example, when, if, if uh, in the articles of association, a company is designed to last for a certain period of time for a fixed period and after the period has um, come to an end uh, the company can be wind up voluntarily according to the articles of association and if the members believe that uh, the business should not uh, be continued for whatever reasons uh, the members can pass a special resolutions as we talked about earlier to wind up the company and if the company cannot, by any reason, uh, meet its liabilities or continue its business, the company can be wind up after passing a special resolution. Um, if the directors of a company or in case of a company having more than two directors, most of the directors deliver a winding up statement that the company should be wind up after passing a resolution uh, according to a board meeting, then uh, they can wind up as well. So basically, uh, the members, the creditors, and the directors can initiate a voluntary winding up. Okay, and there are two types of uh, voluntary winding up: members voluntary winding up and creditors voluntary winding up. 
The main difference between the two is whether the companies can meet its debt and liabilities in the coming 12 months. If the companies can pay up its debt in the next 12 months, in the coming 12 months, uh, the directors of the company shall produce a certificate of solvency before the wind up resolution was passed. And then uh, after that, uh, continue with other um, members voluntary uh, uh, winding up procedures. And if the companies cannot pay its debt in the next 12 months, no certificate of solvency can be produced. And in that case, when they are trying to pass a resolution of winding up, creditors should be invited to the meeting and uh, also uh, the company must also produce a notice of meeting in the Gazette and newspaper and also uh, a statement of the position of the company's affairs and a list of creditors showing the amount of debt shall be presented to the meeting at which the liquidator and a committee of inspection will be appointed to supervise the uh, process. So basically, if you cannot meet your debt in the next 12 months, it will be a creditor voluntary winding up. And if a company can meet its debt in the next 12 months, then it will be a member's voluntary winding up. The main difference is whether they can meet its debt. Okay. Last but not least, it is the time we advertise our products. If you are a candidate and need help in licensing examination for securities and futures intermediaries, HKS ILE, or insurance qualifying examinations, IIQE, you can visit www.2cexam.com to take a look at our product and services which include mock questions, private tutorial and classes. For inquiries regarding HKSI licensing examinations, you are welcome to contact our staff through the following methods. By website, www.2cexam.com By phone, 2110964444 by email info at tusexam.com by whatsapp 9347206443